Good evening, everyone. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and on behalf of the Lancaster Conservancy, welcome to Nature Hour. We are so excited to have this incredible group of professionals from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation joining us this evening for this lecture. Lancaster Conservancy's mission is to provide wild and forested lands and clean waterways for our community forever. We were founded in 1969 by a small group of hunters, anglers, and naturalists who banded together to acquire and protect our critical forests, wetlands, and streams. In the last several years, we have doubled down on this goal. We continue to seek out natural and forested lands that are threatened by development, in particular along the Susquehanna River, and purchase those to open up to the community forever to protect those streams to clean our water resources, both in the Susquehanna River and in the Chesapeake Bay, which you're gonna learn more about this evening. We're also committed to running programs like this evening, this virtual education series each winter and fall as a vehicle to share our organization's work and the work of our community partners. Upcoming nature hours include Made in the Shade, Gardening with Shade-Loving Natives with Mount Cuba Center on March 10th, and there and back again, A Migrant's Tale with Hawk Mountain Sanctuary on March 24th. You can learn more and pre-register for these lectures on our website, lancasterconservancy.org, under upcoming events. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation and the Lancaster Conservancy have had a long-standing partnership that includes youth education with the CBF-led PA Student Action and Restoration Program, which is active at both Climbers Run Nature Center and Kelly's Run Nature Preserve. CBF's Keystone 10 Million Tree Partnership provides the Conservancy thousands of native trees and shrubs each spring, which we plant on our preserves and distribute to homeowners through our Community Wildlife Habitat Program. Finally, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and Keystone 10 Million Tree Partnership have been important partners in helping us build out a very successful Lancaster Water Week. The Conservancy is blessed with incredible corporate support and tonight we wanna to recognize our annual sponsors, Clark Associates, Electron Energy, Ritu Associates, Penstone, and Nimblest. Thank you to these local companies for your commitment to supporting our work. And now I'm going to turn the program over to our engagement coordinator, Keith Williams. Welcome, Keith. Thanks, Fritz. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, really excited for this presentation about oysters in a clear bay. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation has really been leading the charge to save the bay for more than 50 years. And, you know, the land that Fritz was talking about just a minute ago that we pr preserve forever uh, has far more reaching effects than just our local community ecologically. Uh, and those effects certainly include the Chesapeake Bay. And so I'm really excited to hear from our panel of experts from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation tonight. So in addition to being the lead advocate for a clean and restored bay, uh, CBF has an award-winning uh, education program that's the largest in the East Coast, one of the largest in the country. And with us tonight are a group of educators from CBF from across the watershed, uh, which is kind of a fitting um, a note because we're talking about connections between our part of the world, York and, and Lancaster counties, and all the way down to where Captain Jesse Marsh is going to be coming from Smith Island uh, in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. And so we've got Kathleen Davis from Richmond tonight. Again, Captain Jesse is coming from Smith Island. Uh, Liz Glaston and uh, Cassie Penn and Captain Doug Walters are all coming to us from Pennsylvania. Uh, CBF has got a really robust PA education program going on. And so thank you all for joining us tonight to tell us all about oysters and a clear bay and the relationships between the lands that we protect forever here in the Susquehanna Valley and those oysters down in the bay. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Liz Glaston, and I am an educator with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation coming to you today from Pennsylvania, like Keith said. Um, and wanted to thank everybody for joining us tonight for Nature Hour and thank Lancaster Conservancy for inviting us tonight. Um, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, we're the largest conservation dedicated to saving the bay. We do it in those three ways of ad advocacy, advocating for laws reducing pollution, protecting habitats and protecting the people of the watershed. Through restoration, where we restore habitats through our programs like oyster gardening and planting forested riparian buffer. And in the third and my personal favorite way through education, like we're doing here tonight, sharing the knowledge of what makes our bay special and how everyone can take actions to help save the bay and its rivers. 
Like I said, my name is Liz Glaston. I'm an educator with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation coming to you from Northern Lancaster County along my favorite river, the Susquehanna River. I've been with CBF for four years working on the Mobile Canoe Program and the Student Action and Restoration Program. I'm going to let my fellow educators introduce themselves now. Good evening, everyone. My name is Doug Walters, and I'm also an educator with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I started my time down on an island program where we would get students uh, down to the bay. I uh, was down there for about seven years, and now I run a canoe program up here in Pennsylvania where we get students out on local waterways all over the Susquehanna watershed. And good evening, everyone. My name is Kathleen Davis. Uh, like everyone else, I am an educator with the Bay Foundation based in v Richmond, Virginia, uh, a little further south in the Bay. Uh, I run the mobile canoe program that uh, services the eastern half of Virginia, but I was fortunate to also spend quite a bit of time working on the island programs uh, with one of my favorite educators, Captain Jesse Marsh, and I'll let him introduce himself now. Thank you, Kathleen. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Jesse Marsh, a resident of Smith Island. I uh, lived here, from here, born here. My father was from here, you know, forever. I've been working for CVS, uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, that is for over 25 years, running boats for them around the island. And this is, this is life for me. We're all so excited to be here with you today to explore oysters and how Pennsylvania connects to the health of the Bay and the connection to oysters itself. We wanna start off by exploring our connection in Pennsylvania to the Bay by imagining our favorite ecosystems in their healthiest form. We're going to open it up now for a word cloud activity using your phone or mobile device or opening other browser on your computer. Go to menti.com and enter the code below, 9309978. Kathleen should be dropping that information right into the chat for you. Now, once you get there, enter in some words you think of when you're imagining a healthy Susquehanna River. This code will be on the um, web page that I'm going to be sharing with you momentarily. So like I said, please go to menti.com and enter in the code 9309978. And tell us what words come to mind when you picture a healthy Susquehanna River. What words would you use to describe it? What plants and animals do you see? Oh, my favorite, the great blue heron makes an appearance right away. And now with a word cloud, the more people who think of the same words, the larger that word is going to be. And I know it takes a few minutes or seconds just to get to that web page and start entering in those ideas. Hmm. Plankton, clean, lots of diversity. These are all words that I love to hear and see when we're thinking about healthy ecosystems. Oh, I love that great blue heron is still the biggest on the screen. Ooh, somebody threw in a fish emoji, very nice. We have so many cool fish in the river. One of my favorite being the, um, the bass. Those are always fun. They give up a good fight for sure and have a really cool ecology. I'm seeing underwater grasses like our native Vallisneria Americana, not only in the river, but we also see that American celery grass down in the bay. Eagles, Helgramites, Arrow Arum, one of a cool, those awesome wetland plants. Eels, oh, a really great connector from Pennsylvania to the bay. Eels migrate and have different parts of their life cycle in the bay and in the freshwater rivers like the Susquehanna. moving water, oxygen, people, clear. These are all excellent words. Now I want you to take a moment and also start to imagine what you see when you think of a healthy Chesapeake Bay. And I'm really interested and excited to see what words we can compare to our Susquehanna word cloud. I'm seeing oysters, rockfish, stripers, all excellent critters. Boating. We love to boat on the Chesapeake Bay. Jesse's going to tell you some amazing stories about his time on the bay, and I'm sure some of them will include a boat. Yep, seeing more critters like mussels, herons, eels again. 
This is excellent, friends. Thank you so much, everybody, for sharing these words with us. And look at that word cloud continue to grow. Oyster still being our number one word, which is great because we're going to spend more time today exploring oysters. And with that, I'm going to switch it back over to Kathleen to start with our next little activity to get our minds going. All right, so we're going to introduce this concept of the oyster Crustacea virginica. Uh, and we're going to do this by playing a little game. And this game might seem a little familiar to you if you are an NPR nerd like myself. Uh, listening to National Public Radio is one of my favorite things to do while I'm driving. So we're going to play the game Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. If you haven't played before, no worries. So what will happen is that three of our wonderful educators will read three outstanding, outrageous, wild, oyster-related stories, uh, and you will have to determine which of them is true because only one of them will be true. So our very first story will come to us from Captain Jesse Marsh. So tell us what the story is. Okay, all right, uh, here we go. Biologists were shocked to discover a string like material found within the gut of an oyster is in fact the world's only known free-floating organ, which is used to whip particles into a slurry. This organ can be consumed by the oyster when times are hard, and then it can build a new one when times are better and it needs it. Completely wild. That is our first option for you, the world's only free-floating organ. Don't know if that's true or not yet. Let's hear our second story coming to you from Captain Doug. While studying the evolutionary physiology of the Eastern oyster, researchers determined that the early ancestors of the shellfish had small calcified teeth along the bill of each shell. Used primarily for defense, these teeth were phased out over generations to favor the softer cilia we see in modern day oysters. Wild, who would have thought that? And that is our second story and our third story coming to you from Liz. Geneticists at Horn Point Laboratory in Dorchester, Maryland, recently discovered that oysters reproduce more successfully when paired with the same mate. This information has added oysters to the short list of organisms around the world that mate for life. All right, so your third option then is oysters mating for life. So your three options are now on the screen and we will have a poll popping up for you in just one moment and you will have the option to put your thoughts in. Which of these do you think is the only true story? I'll give you a second to respond. And drum roll, please. So it was a toss up. We did have options for or, uh, people voting options for all of them. So uh, Jesse is the truth teller in the story. Oysters do have the world's only free floating organ, uh, which is wild. Um, it always, it's bonkers to me that that's a real thing. Um, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to do a little Q&A with Captain Jesse and interview him and he's going to be able to tell us a lot more about these oysters. But before we do that, um, Jesse's situated in a really unique place in the Chesapeake Bay and I think it's important for us to know a little background on this place. So taking a look at the screen, uh, you'll see a watershed map of the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, as you can see, it spans six different states uh, and that green region is specifically the Susquehanna watershed within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So um, the entire New York portion of the Chesapeake Bay watershed and the majority of the Pennsylvania region of the Chesapeake Bay watershed drain to the Susquehanna bringing with it uh, 50 to 70% of the Chesapeake Bay's fresh water. 
Now, if we switch our view to a satellite image, it kind of zooms in a little bit closer to the Chesapeake Bay itself. Um, you can see this is a really dynamic area. There's a lot of different land uses and specifically, um, you know, the Bay region itself, all that fresh water coming down is going to have an impact on the habitats, the culture and history or the culture of the region and historically uh, influenced the region. And then the economy and the seafood of the region as well. Uh, so we're going to zoom in to Smith Island, a tiny little marshy spit of land in the very center of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it's an archipelago of, of little marshy lands. Now the whole northern portion of the island is actually a wildlife refuge, um, Martin's Wildlife Refuge, but there are three individual communities that make up uh, the island itself. Only about 190 people uh, are full-time residents of the island and then within these three communities, the smallest being Rhodes Point on the eastern portion of the island. Uh, the big town of Yule, which has about 90 people, but of course they have a fuel dock and a grocery store and a couple of restaurants, which sets them apart from the other two. And then the very small uh, middle-sized island of Tylerton, which is where Jesse comes to us from this evening. Um, so Jesse, to start off this little interview session, would you mind telling us a little background about Smith Island? All right, uh, that's the background behind me is the community of Tylerton, where I was born and raised and reside today. And uh, I'll point out that if you notice behind me, one or, or, over my left shoulder, there's like the biggest building you'll see, right? Right? Like, let's say, how can I do it? Right there. <laughs> All right, that's the church. Just to give you an idea of what it's like here, uh, that church was built in 1929, that was the second church of Tylerton, and my grandmother was the first funeral in this church that we're looking at in this picture, all right, she died in 1929, the church was not completed, they had to have her funeral uh, in the basement because they were still working in the upstairs part, which is the main part of the church, all right, so also, my, grand, my grandfather's funeral was held there. My father, my mother's older funerals were held there. And I was baptized there. That's the size of this community. And everybody, every one of those houses that has a full-time Smith Islander in it has the same story as I do. We're all connected as you can get. You know, we're one family. Uh, and when I look at that picture, the aerial picture, I remember the first time I seen an aerial. How do people live on a small piece of land like that for, for 400 years, but we've done it. I mean, we're spread out all over the island. And remember, this is just one community. But, and I can tell you why. I mean, the only thing I can come up is, I remember I left it one time. Moved away from the uh, First was hired at one of our other centers about, 20 miles north of here, 25 miles north of here. And it was a, uh, uh, it was fun. You know, my mother was still here. You know, I had home to come back to. But I remember when, when mom moved off of there, all her children moved. So she saw that she was moving. I didn't have home to come back to. So uh, it hit reality struck me and I had to come back. You know, I mean, uh, it's just, the family feeling that I don't think you could experience uh, anywhere. I couldn't find it, that's for sure. And I know other people that moved away and could not find it. In fact, a couple of other ones came back. So anyway, this is home, I love it. And what uh, the war business is what's made this last for so many years, all right? Uh, which is primarily has been oysters. Now it's more crab than oyster. But it goes back and forth a little, but really the oyster is what built. So tell us a little bit about the, the history of oystering on Smith Island. Well, it, it began, uh, really began, at, all right, at first they done a lot of barter thing, a bartering system here. What they did, some uh, raised cattle, some raised vegetables, you know, the typical farming thing. But also some people uh, were more drawn to the water, brung in oysters, brung in uh, uh, fish, obviously, and later on crabs. They were like the last one to come in, all right? Uh, 
so they just sort of traded. You know, it wasn't much money here. I mean, it was like almost no money. It was all about it, we were self-contained, which I think is the cool. I would love to go back and be able to witness that. I really would. But then after the Civil War, uh, the railroad came to Crisfield. And when the railroad came, it opened up a lot of doors. I mean, uh, oysters mainly, because oysters were coming in. Probably more oysters went through Crisfield, Maryland, than any other town on the bay, possibly, uh, because they were so plentiful here at the time. And, and, and there were just train loads of them going out, and the market just kept getting bigger and bigger because the railroad was going further and further. Seemed like, you know, just a pot of gold that would never end. All right. So that's, that's the big thing about oysters and, and what, where the economy started here. The real, when money came to the island, pretty much the book. So what's a, what's a day in the life like for a waterman who's oystering out on the bay? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard life. You know, I've done it. I was raised into it. Um, I mean, I'm, I don't even know how many generations it goes back, at least five, that's been doing it. And, and I've done it. You know, I, I was raised to be a waterman. I had a brother, too, who dad knew it wasn't in him. So he went off to the mainland to earn a living. Uh, he, he, mom always told me that dad knew it was in me from the beginning. And, and I was the one that, and I did, took over his business, never wanted anything but that. Uh, the bay of a uh, waterman like my father, a wisterman, a crabber, a uh, fish like my father. And I done it, and I done it. Uh, and it was really hard to leave. Uh, but I didn't really, I didn't completely leave it. I just done it different. I've done it with children. The Bay, Chesapeake Bay Foundation came here in 1978, and I became friends with them. I was intrigued by what they do. Uh, went to work for them, and still working for them over 25 years later. So uh, I, I still feel like a waterman. I'm still licensed. Technically, I am a waterman, and I'm still out there. And, and I thank God I'm still out there. I really do. Uh, because that's what I love, I and mean, that's what I think Dad would be happy with. It. I really do. So, in I don't terms know of completely answering your question, that's just the way I am. So, in terms of the economy of the island, oysters still play a big role in. Uh, right now, right now, they've been the king this year. Uh, last couple of years, last two years, they have, and it's the first time. Since probably the 80s, early 90s, somewhere in there, uh, oysters are doing really well in this area. Uh, and it, I mean, it's, it's big. I mean, just about, about oysters, and because it went down, the oyster business really uh, went down low a few years back, you know, like, like 30 years back. And part of the reason why I'm on here today. Uh, why I work for the Chesapeake, Foundation, Chesapeake Bay Foundation today. Back in the uh, 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 80s, mid 80s, these diseases hit. Dermo and MSX, well, Dermo actually has been around a long time, but MSX is the one, that's the killer. It took like 90 some percent of our oysters over one summer. It, it devastated the oyster industry. And I was still oystering. And I just, I just get bought a new boat, mostly for oystering. I already had one before it, the one I took over at Dad's. But I, I got this new one, and I went up the bay. See, the diseases thrive in the saltier waters of the bay. All right? So I went to the upper bay. We all, well, us that stuck with the oyster, done, done good. But the problem was it, it wasn't big enough to support us all. Uh, what the rest of them done was put a lot more pressure on the crab, to, just poured all their efforts all they could into the crab. But we stayed in the oyster, done well. Uh, but then gradually, after about 12, 13 years, oysters slowly begin to come back down here to the point now where it, it, it is. It's the highest since before mid 80s. Yeah, so it's so interesting to hear about, you know, kind of the, the economic gravity of this one species. 
Um, but other than the economic reasons, are there any other benefits of these oysters in your area? Yeah, um, uh, uh, you know, certainly uh, for the bay itself, for the health of the bay, because they filter. They, they, they are a filter feeder. They draw water in and spit it back out. When it comes through, they pull the sediments, which is a big one. That's one of our biggest pollutants. And the other big, bigger one is nutrients. It takes both of them out of the water. Uh, the sediment uh, is a big thing, too, for us because it, um, it, it, protects, it helps protect the grass beds. The grass beds are, uh, I mean, a huge habitat around here. we got lots of shallow water, lots of grass beds, and the oysters keep that sediment, a lot of that sediment out. Uh, so that the grasses can grow. All right, what happens is with the sun, when you got a lot of sediment in, the water, sediment in the water, sun can't penetrate, grasses can't grow. With that grass, we got pretty much nothing here, at least for half of the year. So that's, that's a big deal. Uh, and, you know, it also takes uh, uh, the nutrients, cause a lot of uh, 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 algae in the water. The algae also cloud the water. But they do a lot of other things too. They create dead summers, which is a very bad thing. Uh, so, uh, I mean, oysters, they're pretty useful all around. They, they're not only um, money for us in the winter, but they create money for us in the summer uh, and they create a healthy value, which is for all of us. Yeah, it sounds like that whole positive feedback loop of being that economic source, being that food source, but also cleaning the water so that there are other economic sources somewhere else. Um, so how, how do you all in the community, you're working the water, how do you find that balance between um, oysters helping to protect the environment and oysters being that economic importance? Uh, well, one, it, it, it's a lot of stuff to do with Mother Nature uh, and in the opinion of the average Smith Island person, it's got a lot to do with God. It's, it's always been a very religious community. Uh, the churches, if you look at the picture behind me, everything's built around the church and that's just the way it is. It's no joke that it's right in the middle. I mean, it's no uh, coincidence that it's right in the middle. It's no coincidence that when you head towards Smith Island, from many directions, the first thing you will see is the three churches on the island. There's one in each community. Uh, that's just to give you an idea how big it is. And they put a lot of faith in God, and that's part of it. Uh, but a huge part of it is the balance is, all right, uh, it it's always been this way, and anybody here, and some a lot older than me, uh, will tell you that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I lost it again. That happened. Uh, anyway, all right. So we are a tight knit community and we depend on each other. We really do. Uh, all right. We have really good years oystering and really bad years oystering. The same with crabs. Sometimes the oyster is king, sometimes the crab is king. And it rarely ever, almost never happens that both of them are at once. Uh, and it all also along with that, it never happens that neither one of them are any good one. Somehow it balances out. And the people here would say it's God, and maybe they're right. We'll let you think about that. All right. But also being such a close knit community, we help each other. Uh, sometimes there's a health issue with somebody, people jump in and help. All right. That's been that's been the story here all my life and well beyond that. I was personal experience. When I was uh, you know, I, I was all right, this was so I was like eleven, I believe. And my father had a heart attack. My father I was the last of, of five children. Uh and I was the youngest obviously and, and dad had a heart attack and he had to go to Baltimore and have open heart surgery. This was in nineteen 70, 78, I believe. Uh, that was a big deal, and it's still a big deal. But back in those days, he was up to Baltimore all winter, and mom was there with him. So me and my brothers and sisters were home alone. Uh, but 
and and uh, what amazed me about it and what I'll never forget, one of the things that burned me back was every night, every night, dinner came to the front door. We never knew where it was coming from. They had it organized so that every night one of the women around here came to the front door with their dinner. Uh, we were looked out for. I mean, you know, all all kids, you know. So uh, we were looked out for by everybody more than we realized. We, I, I don't think any of us did until we got older and thought back on it. But that was just that was just my story. There was many stories like that around here, and it's still happening today. So, uh, you know, I mean, being from Smith Island is probably, I know it is, one of the proudest things in my life. It's a, it's a perfect glimpse into an example of how your community functions is just acknowledging the fact that there was dinner on your doorstep when you were, uh, you know, struggling. Um, but to end this interview, I'm, I'm curious, um, what is your favorite thing about the Eastern oyster? Uh, it's really hard not to say cooking it and eating it, you know, uh, uh, but it, it would have to be looking at the bigger picture uh, without the Eastern oyster. Uh, I might not be a Smith owner. There might not be a Smith owner because it uh, a big deal. It was the backbone here. Uh, Am I back? Yeah. That's oh. All right. All right. Sorry, my my speaker cuts off on me. But yeah, it's got to be that. I mean, I don't. I, honestly, I don't know how this community would have survived without the oyster. I mean, in modern times, in the old days, it could have. But later on, you had to have money, and that was that was the backbone of the economy and I don't think we would have survived without it. So that is my favorite thing about the oyster. But I do love to eat them and I love to cook them, try new ways to make oysters. You can have multiple answers, Jesse, that's all right. Uh, but it's a great answer and it shows the gravity of this single species on the impacts of the bay culturally and historically, uh, economically. And uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to pass it to Doug to kind of recap some of those really important biological features that make this oyster uh, what it is and, and bring the importance home for us. Yeah, so Jesse touched on a ton of the, the important aspects of the oyster um, and why it's beneficial to the bay and of course the, the economy and the people around it. Um, and we'll touch on those a little bit more as well as some of the the really cool life facts and life history of the oyster. Um, so oysters are one of the bivalves that live in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, bivalves meaning they have two openings, uh, one to suck food in and one to push out the waste. Uh, so they are filter feeders, which is really cool. Uh, Jesse talked about how they uh, eat algae and stuff like that. So they're, they're sucking water in and they're filtering out, searching for that algae. And when they're doing that, they're also sucking in some other things like nutrients, uh, sediment and stuff like that. And they turn it into a byproduct called pseudo feces, which they then push out of the shell and collects on the bottom of the bay, uh, which is a lot better place for it than floating around in the water column, making the water really cloudy so the sunlight can't get down into the underwater grasses and the other things living down there. Um, so in these pictures, we've got the little diagram of the anatomy of the oyster. Where it's uh, pointing to the stomach, that is where that really cool free floating organ is, uh, the, um, the sty. So it's really cool in the fact that they can grow it when there's abundant food, they grow this organism. And then when the food uh, kind of starts to slacken off in the winter time, uh, there's not as much algae growing in the winter with uh, the cooler water and the less sunlight. Uh, so they can actually digest the crystalline sty uh, to get the energy back out of it and then they grow it again when the food uh, becomes plentiful which is a really really cool adaptation um, that they have developed and the reason they have this is uh, the algae and the plankton and stuff that they're eating has a harder shell um, so to digest it is quite hard so they kind of use it like a blender and it spins around in the stomach and it whips up the the food and makes it into uh, an edible i guess for them um, sludge, uh, which is a really cool thing. Um, kind of like how cows can uh, 
you know, redigest stuff in their stomach. They're breaking it down to be able to use again. Um, so the oysters have kind of developed their method of being able to break down something that is hard to digest. Um, and then the cilia that we had mentioned jokingly that originally started as teeth, those are what's helping to filter. It's collecting as the water is going through, it's collecting the algae, and then they kind of can rake stuff down and into the mouth. Um, so we'll jump to the next slide so we can see a little bit of the life cycle. So oysters are broadcast spawners. So what that means is the male will clap out the sperm into the water column and the female will clap out the egg. And then they have to be relatively close to each other for them to meet. Uh, this is all reliant on uh, the currents in the water for those two to meet. And once they meet, uh, it becomes this fertilized egg and that starts to float around in the water column. And this is the only point in the oyster's life that they're actually moving around and they're not set in one spot. Uh, and as they grow, so we've got kind of this, uh, this diagram that shows the, the cycle, um, but also on the left, that top picture is a oyster releasing, I believe that's a male oyster releasing the sperm into the water column. Um, so the next step would be the, the next picture down, which are little tiny oyster shells. Uh, they're about the, the size or a little bigger than the, the tip of a pen. Um, and they start to grow this little thing that you can see sticking out of the shell and that's called the foot. Uh, and they are going to have that sticking out and they're gonna float around and they're looking for something hard to land on or to strike as we call it. And typically their favorite thing to land on is another oyster shell. So when you see oysters growing in the wild, they're usually growing attached to each other, making these three-dimensional reefs, uh, which have tons of benefits, which we'll get to in a moment. And they'll strike on anything that's hard. Um, as Jesse will attest, a lot of times, oysters will strike on the bottom of boats. Uh, so it's quite common for the watermen to haul their boats out at, in the summertime and have oyster spat and shell uh, growing on their boats. Um, so once they've struck and they've landed on something hard, they become known as spat, which is a juvenile oyster, uh, which they start to grow and up to about the one inch. Once they get to about one inch, they're no longer known as spat. Um, and then they start to grow. And oysters typically grow about an inch a year uh, under normal circumstances. So if there's enough food in the water column uh, and the water temperatures are right, uh, that's about what they can grow. Um, once they get beyond that, the, the oysters have this really cool ability to actually change their sex. So most juvenile oysters, most oysters under three inches are going to be males. And then once they hit that, that maturity of about two and a half, three inches, they start to kind of sense with the pheromones in the water, uh, what the breakdown of their particular oyster reef is, male, female, and they will adjust and change so they can kind of keep a balanced uh, community on their oyster rock, uh, which is a really cool adaptation to be able to survive uh, since they can't, you know, get up and travel long distances. They're only reproducing on that localized area. Um, so these are some of the reasons. It's also really important when we have, um, when you eat oysters yourself, not to just throw the shells away, but to actually recycle them. Um, there's recycling programs all over the watershed where you can take your oyster shells back to, they clean them and they put them back out on the water. So the juvenile oysters will have something to strike on, which is really cool. Um, so lifespan of an oyster um, is, I don't know if there's an actual known end date. I think it's as long as they don't get caught or they don't become food, um, they'll continue to grow. There are some um, oyster shells from prior to uh, like modern day that are about the size of a dinner plate. Um, so if they're growing an inch a year, you know, that's a 10, 15 year old oyster, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, but I don't know an exact life age for them, but they continue to grow as long as the food sources are there. Um, so we'll jump to the next slide and those oyster reefs that they make, these three dimensional shapes are amazing habitat uh, for tons of different animals that live in and around the oyster reef. Um, so you can see the top picture is one of my favorite fish in the bay, something that a lot of people don't know about. And this is the oyster toadfish, which have developed an extremely strong jaw that they can crunch through juvenile oyster shells uh, to get the meat out from the inside. Uh, and they kind of hide in and amongst the oyster shells, uh, just like the Chesapeake Bay's, uh, you know, one of their most famous critters, the blue crab, also love to eat oysters and will live in and along in and among the oysters themselves on the oyster reef, um, as long as, uh, or as well as sponges and, 
shrimp, which is the center pitcher, uh, and a lot of other fish. So they really provide this great uh, habitat for lots of different animals uh, to live in. So beyond just the, the being an animal themselves and being food, they're also providing shelter for a lot of animals, which is really cool. And now we're going to jump to one of my favorite things that the oysters do, and that is filtering water. So oysters, like I said, are filter feeders. So as they're sucking in that water, they're getting all the food they want. They're getting the byproducts, the sediment, uh, the excess nutrients and stuff like that. And they're doing it at an amazing rate. So a three inch oyster on average can filter about 50 gallons of water a day, uh, which is quite a bit. If you imagine 55 gallon trash can, uh, one three inch oyster can filter that in one day on average. Uh, the, there's some math that around the time that Captain John Smith sailed up the bay, uh, there is approximately 17 trillion gallons of water in the bay and the oysters could filter that in under two weeks. They could filter all the water in the bay. There were that many oysters. Um, at the lowest point, they got down to where it took about three years. Uh, the population was so small that it took about three years for the oysters to filter uh, when they hit their low point in the, in the 70s and 80s. Um, but with the oysters having come back, they're really creating kind of a tipping point to the fact that they are filtering the water and they are really helping to clean the water themselves. So once we can get that algae to a level where they can actually maintain and start to filter it and clean it themselves, uh, you know, the water quality is going to continue to go up. And that's kind of where we tie into uh, the PA aspect. And we can go to the next slide just so we have a real quick diagram of uh, a cloudy tank with oysters in it and over time you can see how much they filtered it out and this is where we tie into things like trees up in Pennsylvania and how they do very similar things to the oysters uh, and to talk more about that we'll pass it on over to Liz. Thank you so much Doug. I love all about those oysters, these cool little bivalves that do so much to filter our streams and rivers and bays. Well, I guess not streams so much, they're in the, the salt water, but like Doug alluded to, those bivalves are not the only filters we have in the bay. We have plants and they are found across the watershed and in every ecosystem. They're vital to the health of all of our waterways. Now, my favorite filter, the tree, is a gorgeous plant and you may be thinking Liz how does the crown how does the um, the branches and the trunk of the tree filter the water well my friends it's not what's above the ground that does the filtering of course it's underground in these roots and the roots of a plant do an amazing job at filtering the nitrates and phosphates nutrients that are found in fertilizer in waste from our pets from farm animals and even from us those roots suck up extra water from all that stormwater runoff filtering pollutants out, not just those nutrients. And finally, those roots act like an amazing net to hold back the soil, stabilizing it and preventing erosion, which leads to sedimentation. One of those threats to the Chesapeake Bay that Captain Jesse was telling us about back earlier when we were interviewing him about his connection with oysters. So these filters, these plants, together they form a riparian buffer Forested riparian buffer is a term that many of us may be familiar with. For some of us, it's new, but that's the fancy word for all of the plants, the flowers, the shrubs, the grasses, the forbs, and the trees that work together to filter the water. Sometimes people, though, think about another plant that is found along stream sides, maybe in our parks or down by the city rivers, those flowing, beautiful hills of green turf grass. Well, not all roots in our plants are created equal. The roots of turf grass are only about two inches long, represented by this piece of yarn. That's not a lot of opportunity to hold back soil, preventing erosion or absorbing those nutrients. There are a lot of other plants that have longer roots, like our native nine bark. This string is about 15 feet long, representing the average length of one nine bark shrub root. But as you can guess, there's a plant that does even better at filtering. This is about 170 feet of yarn, quite a bit of yarn, and it represents a single root from a mature oak tree. Think about all of the filtering power this tree holds with all of its roots. Remember, just one root. So trees and shrubs do a little bit better of a job, a lot better of a job than turf grass at keeping our streams and watershed and Chesapeake Bay clean. But 
Filtering power isn't the only thing that our amazing riparian buffers and trees provide to us and our ecosystem. Those shady branches keep our streams cool, keeping the temperatures down and the sun from heating up those waters, which allows more, car uh, more dissolved oxygen to stay suspended in the water. The oxygen that our aquatic critters like macroinvertebrates and brook trout need to survive and thrive. And I know a lot of us really enjoy not only seeing those amazing critters in the river and creeks, but also fishing for them. I know Doug and Cassie are very avid anglers and expert fly fisher people as well. Now, that's not the only thing that our trees provide for us, the habitat, the dissolved oxygen, but they also formulate and base our amazing stream food chains up here in Pennsylvania and across our watershed. For instance, let's start off with a native oak tree up here at the base. This leaf provides food for a ton of critters, some of which you may or may not know. The aquatic macroinvertebrate is a tiny critter without a backbone that lives in our streams. Maybe this buff little flathead mayfly loves to eat native leaves, or perhaps the elegant giant stonefly, another shredder. And finally, you may call me crazy, but they're my favorite macroinvertebrate, the chubby little cranefly. I like to call these fish burritos because fish love to snack on those chubby little crane flies. Now, not only do these macroinvertebrates keep our streams clean from all these amazing leaves, but they also, like I said, start the food chain. The Helgramite is a predator found in our streams and in the Susquehanna River. Many of our anglers may be familiar with them being the favorite bait of bass fisher, fishermen. And like I said, these critters are eaten by some of our favorite fish like the bass and one of my favorite, the beautiful native brook trout. Pennsylvania state fish. These fish love to eat these macroinvertebrates, especially the mayfly. And I think you can all guess where this is going. The fish in turn feed some of our birds like the majestic bald eagle, symbol of America, and my personal favorite, the great blue heron. So not only do trees in Pennsylvania provide shade, filter nutrients and sediment out of the water, but they also provide the base of a dynamic and integrated food web that allows so many of us to enjoy our streams by exploring and fishing. Now, Pennsylvania has been doing a lot to help conserve and preserve the upland waters that feed into the Chesapeake Bay. And we do this through restoration like our K10 or Keystone 10 Million Trees Partnership where we're working together with partners like the Lancaster Conservancy to plant 10 million trees across Pennsylvania by 2025. So far, we've planted over 1,400 acres of riparian buffers, which equals over 285,000 individual trees. And I just, I think that's incredible, friends. I may be biased, but I sure love all of the amazing things that trees do for us. Now, I told you a little bit about my favorite restoration program, the K-10 program, but my friend Cassie is going to tell you about some other opportunities to get involved with the work that we do. Thank you so much, Liz. So I just wanted to take a couple of moments before we go on to the question and answer portion of this evening to let you share some information with you about how you can become involved and support our efforts to save the Bay. So my name is Cassie Fenn and I'm the Pennsylvania Student Leadership and Education Coordinator for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And um, we have a lot of volunteer efforts ongoing throughout the watershed, including advocacy efforts such as signing on to action alerts about proposed legislation or volunteering on restoration projects such as planting trees or restoring oyster reefs. And there are regional initiatives that you can check out on our website. All this information will be sent after the program along with the recording. There are also opportunities to become involved through the Keystone 10 Million Trees Partnership that Liz mentioned, as well as the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance. And I strongly recommend visiting these um, websites as well. They're coordinated by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and they're starting to populate for opportunities coming in this spring for tree plantings up in Pennsylvania, as well as locations where you can drop off oyster shells for recycling in Virginia and Maryland. Now on to education. So for more than 40 years, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation has provided meaningful environmental education experiences to more than 1 million students throughout the watershed. 
Due to COVID-19, we've been running virtual programs, one of which you just experienced. If you are a teacher or know a teacher, we have our online watershed learning program running through the first week of June. Essentially, our educators are able to provide students environmental instruction online while at the same time giving them the opportunity to discover our unique species, such as oysters, and ecosystems while examining the most pressing environmental challenges of the watershed. Coming this summer, we have professional learning courses for teachers, which run watershed wide as part of our Chesapeake Classrooms program, and teachers can earn professional development credits in their respective states. And if you are a student or no one, our student leadership program offers high school students opportunities to expand their knowledge of Bay issues, while also learning how to lead others to advance advocacy, take action, and raise awareness on clean water issues facing their communities. Beginning in June, my colleagues and I will be leading several week-long student leadership expeditions, and applications for the summer program will be available on March 1st. And finally, if you're not a teacher or a student but want to continue learning more about the Bay, CBF hosts webinars on a regular basis. The next one is March 8th on fisheries and striped bass management. Please visit our events calendar, which can also be found on our website. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email address, I'll pop up into the chat. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'll turn it back over to Keith, who's going to moderate our Q&A. Wow, uh, thank you all so much. That was a lot, <laughs> absolutely amazing. Um, just really scratching the surface, so that's pretty incredible. I've got a couple of questions, and my, my first one to lead off is, uh, and I think this is for the whole panel, since you really do, uh, you know, span the entire watershed. Can you comment on the effect of protected land uh, in the upper watershed on the health of the lower bay, uh, specifically oysters? Yeah, I would say, you know, protected land with forested buffers and all that uh, is a huge aspect because, you know, upstreams where all the pollutants make their way down to the bay. Um, and it's all the things like sediment pollution and stuff like that that's, that's coming down that's really affecting the oysters. So, you know, beyond the benefits that we get locally from protecting our streams, uh, it also definitely helps downriver. Um, and the great benefits of having better fisheries and stuff like that locally is you know, a huge bonus as well. Yeah, definitely agree. And, you know, I, I've also learned that it's a two-way flow of energy, right? So we often think of a, a watershed as just downstream, but what happens downstream affects upstream, especially, you know, the most obvious is, is in the form of migratory fish. And a lot of those migrations are really, are really impaired right now because of a number of reasons. And so, um, you know, the land that we protect up in the upper watershed has an effect on both those things, on that, on that two-way flow of energy. Um, and, and related, I think maybe this one might be for, for maybe for Jesse. Um, has the oyster population changed uh, today compared to what it was 40 years ago for the better, for the worse? And, and you know, related to that, what kind of changes have you seen personally uh, in your part of the Bay? Uh, it has changed uh, 40 years ago. I, I go pretty long and it was pretty good then. I don't know. I doubt we're at that point yet, but uh, it has improved a lot. I mean, I, I've, I've seen, seen the worst of it so far, uh, and we're way better than that at this point. The biggest problem right now, uh, and what might reflect in the numbers at the end of the year, is they're not able to work. The market is not supporting how many oysters they're catching because of COVID-19. Okay, right. Yeah, I didn't think about that that aspect of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then this one, I think, is for the the greater panel, but certainly maybe maybe uh, uh, Doug and 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 Jesse. Um, we had a couple of questions about MSX and Dermo, and I know that I think Jesse mentioned those. Can you talk a little bit more fully about what those diseases are and where they came from, and what effect they're having on the oysters, and if there's been any signs of resistance, disease resistance in our native oysters to those diseases? Well, Dermo has been around a long time. I'm pretty sure longer than they know of. Uh, MSX came in in like the late 60s, if I recall right, uh, but didn't really reach its peak until the mid 80s. Uh, and, and I mean, it's the, by far the bad one. MSX has is, is, is not been nasty. Uh, and uh, like I said earlier, it, it does most of its damage 
and saltier years. Uh, it thrives in salty water. In fact, when it done its most damage in the mid 80s uh, was uh, because we had drought years. I mean, a bunch in a row, uh, drought and, and hot temperatures in the summer. And it, it, it devastated the oyster population. Dermo is an occasional problem. Uh, it does have kills like on on an oyster bar here and there, maybe, but not bay wide. Like MSX uh, is is really bad. Uh, it has been no outbreaks of it in quite a while, mainly because, as you probably all have noticed, we've been having some really wet years lately. Watershed yeah. wide. Yeah. Is is MSX native to the to the bay? Do we know that that it's native no, or it, not from it here? Is not. It, was, it is not. It so that's native. an invasive, non-native species. Yes, that's invasive. Okay, great. Well, not great, but but good to know. Right. right. I'll get um, your call. Yeah. And so here's one that just came in that's that's related to all the, the heavy flows that we have. How long does it take the bay and the oysters to recover after we get heavy flows from the Susquehanna? Right. When we have those wet years, uh, that might be a, a good thing for some of those like MSX and Derma that depend on on saltier conditions. But, uh, you know, we're also delivering a heavy load of nutrients and sediments to the lower bay. And so what's the typical what, what kind of well, recovery time are we looking at? It has its good side because it flushes the land off the wet year. Uh, and we may see a benefit uh, after it's by the time it's over. You know, I mean, it does its damage when it does it, but it cleans the land off. And we may see some good years ahead, at least, you know, on a positive note. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what we do on land certainly affects water down there. And so we got to be real mindful of that, you know, and um, and well, everybody yeah. everybody has a hand in that. Like I'm a suburban and I'm not a farmer, but the land that I have in my in my care right now, um, you know, can send just as much nutrient and, and sediment downstream as as a farmer. And so I think we all we're all responsible for our little piece of the world. Um, everybody, everybody in this watershed has a stake in it. We all affect the bay in a negative way. But we can all do stuff to make it. Better. Yeah, and then I think maybe Cassie, this might be for you, possibly Liz. It's a little bit out of the out of the realm, but it uh, it's a good question. So, you know, we see a lot of trash, physical trash, in the Susquehanna coming down, and and there's a question about you know what regulations are there to protect the health of the water of the Susquehanna from the public polluting those waters with trash, and who sets those regulations and um, you know, what efforts are there to get public knowledge out about that trash and what kind of fines and penalties are attached? That's a really great question. Uh, Liz, I'm gonna not completely give the question to you, but I'll, I'll um, the, so the, regulated, the regulatory um, department within the, the government of the state of Pennsylvania is the Department of Environmental Protection. And there are regulations and um, that, are imposed upon individuals and corporations when there is water um, damage done. So when there's damage done to our clean waters. Um, Liz can speak a little bit more about to how those regulations apply specifically to businesses in a former life. She, she worked to kind of um, keep track of some of that information. Yeah, thanks, Cassie. Um, in a former life, I was an environmental scientist in northern New Jersey, dealing with uh, subsurface soil and groundwater um, pollution. But there are um, permits that co um, factories, companies have to go through in order to discharge, and the uh, Susquehanna River Basin Commission handles a lot of that. Um, but thinking about trash and litter, you know, I'm not sure of any specific rules and regulations about it. Um, it is really unfortunate and oftentimes on river trips with students, we spend time picking up litter. It's something that is really there in front of us and students are really aware of and they pick up on that. And we spend time collecting litter and talking about the damaging impacts it has. Um, there are a lot of community groups like the watershed associations and river keepers that lead and schedule trash pickups. but. Regulating something like that is very difficult when Fish and Boat Commission and other regulation authorities already have a lot on their plate. Yeah, yeah great question and a big problem. Mm -hmm. And un unfortunately, we're, uh, we're just about out of time. And I'd like to, to, to hand it off to Jesse to kind of close this out and see if, uh, if you have any, uh, any nuggets of wisdom for us, Jesse. 
Yes, I can. I can do that. All right. I know you're all a long way away from me up in Pennsylvania, but you are a part of this Chesapeake Bay, uh, uh, probably at least. So here we go. Somewhere near you, there's a stream, creek, or river that drains into the Susquehanna and then drains into the bay. You may not see it, but it's there. Remember, whatever you flush down a drain, put on your lawn or driveway, will flow down into the Susquehanna, which will flow down into the bay, eventually, eventually making it into the habitats in and around Smith Island, as well as other waterman communities down here. The people here depend on these habitats to earn a living. So remember what we said here today. Think before you don't and spread the word. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. And thank you all for, for tuning in tonight. If, if we weren't able to get to your question, Cassie did post her uh, email address in the chat. I'm sure she'd be able to field the, uh, the remaining questions that way that we didn't get to. And uh, CBF educators, you know, I'm always in awe of your education program. I always have been. I was a part of your team for a short while in my past life. And so your, your organization is pretty close to my heart. But man, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and all you're doing to educate our students and our adults of the watershed. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. I remember those days. They were good times, Jesse. Yes, they were. <laughs>